I don't know how many, show of hands, how many people um, were at the speaker last Friday? Oh, great. Okay. Um, well, we have been sort of doing a series of speakers on the topic of social emotional learning and development. And um, today we are very, very, very lucky to have um, Dr. Don Deschler from the University of Kansas, um, who has taken his time uh, to come speak with us. And by way of introduction, I'm just going to give you a little bit about him, because otherwise he wouldn't get a chance to speak if I told you his whole story. Um, he, is, um, he is the Williamson Family Distinguished Professor of Special Education at the University of Kansas. He's also the director for the Center for Research on Learning at the University of Kansas. And when Steve talks about him, he talks about him as one of the key people who's involved in special education, learning disabilities, learning differences for decades. Um, he serves as an advisor on the adolescent achievement to several organizations, including the Carnegie Corporation of New York, National Government Association, the Alliance for Excellent Education, Council for Families and Literacy, and the U.S. State Department. Um, through the Aspen Institute, he's worked with members of Congress to shape reform policies and challenges um, in the high school reform. He's uh, the first editor of the Learning Disability Quarterly, and I'm just going to give you a few of his many awards that he's had over the course of his uh, years. He's, a distinct, he's won the Distinguished Education Achievement Award for the National Center for Learning Disabilities, the Educator of the Year for Learning Disabilities Association, uh, in 2010, the AERA Special Education Distinguished Researcher Award. Um, and we're very lucky to have him come talk today about the, uh, the interrelationship between social emotional development and learning differences. And also, um, he spent the morning in the lower school and partially in the middle school. Um, and we're having continued dialogue on how we can help Carol continue to make it a wonderful community, both on the education front and the social emotional development. So without further ado. I apologize for the logistics. It's been such an exciting time here today. We were just got delayed getting here. I'll tell you. I, um, as you can tell from the introduction that Ruth shared with you, I'm old. Um, I have been in education for a long time. I spend uh, a good deal of my time in schools. That's where the action is, that's where you learn. And uh, there are some schools that I uh, visit and I um, walk away just really um, uh, sobered by the challenges that everyone within the school faces. The kids, the teachers, the administrators. Uh, I was sharing with one group, I was in the, doing some work, some research in the Detroit public schools. Um, and so those are sobering times. Today has not been one of those days. Today has been uh, one that I am flying back to Kansas this afternoon. I probably wouldn't need a plane. I'm so <laughs> excited with what I've seen. Um, truly, this is, uh, um, and I say this again, spending my time in schools, the things that are taking place here, uh, the vibrancy in the faces of the kids, that uh, I encountered, to hear the members of the, of the staff and their deep commitment and love uh, for the children has, um, has just really been a treat. So I am I'm honored to be here at one of the premier uh, institutions um, of this kind in the, in the country. Um, so what I'd like to do is just put a, a, a few ideas on the table for you to consider based on what we do as a center. So let me just tell you about us, KU, that's University of Kansas. And someone says, where's Kansas? Check it out. It's one of the sort of squares, <laughs> <laughs> square states. Put it on your bucket list. It is a good place. But the University of Kansas, CRL, Center for Research on Learning. Uh, we just have finished our 35th year, 
And we're passionate about trying to improve the performance of struggling learners. <coughs> Secondly, about improving how teachers instruct academically diverse classes. Thirdly, how can schools be restructured, reshaped? How can classrooms be reshaped to make them better learning environments for kids? And how can we take the, the products we develop because we're not only, it does no good to do research because a teacher can't teach a child from a research article. You've got to take those things and put them into manuals and materials that teachers can use. And so we've done that. We want to get them out because if they, if they work to a lot of folks and we're interested in informed public policy. But here's the problem that's driven our center from its inception. It's called the performance gap. You've heard about it or perhaps the achievement gap. Right? It works like this. If you look at the horizontal axis, that's years in school. You look at the vertical axis and those, those are the skills that kids pick up as they go through school. And so, you look here, that little dotted line. So we assume as a child goes through a year in school, he or she'll pick up a year of skills. Go through three years of school, they pick up three years of skills. So theoretically, that straight line represents normal achievement. Right? So let's watch. Now watch the skill word up there. Oh, do you see that little word, join it? Demands? Do you see that? Okay, now watch the blue line. See how there was a yellow one superimposed on top of that? I did that for this reason, to show that as kids pick up skills at the prescribed rate, they are then in a position to respond to what? the demands of the curriculum. That's, what, that's our goal in school. Well, the, the pre challenge is this. We find that some kids go through school and they don't quite, quite pick up the amount of skills that we would hope they would pick up over time and hence the infamous performance gap or achievement gap develops. Now what is the, the, sort of the sobering part of this story is this. By the time kids hit about the fifth or sixth grade level, we see that their acquisition of skills, especially those who are struggling in learning, tend to plateau. Now this is over thousands, looking at thousands of kids. But it makes the, here's the important part that we can learn a lesson from this. What doesn't, you notice how the demands continue to go? And if the skills are plateauing, that gap gets larger real quickly, doesn't it? Okay, so that's a, that's a real challenge. And to just underscore the magnitude of the challenge, if we take a child who's in the ninth grade and he's reading at the fifth grade level, so there's a gap there. We find him over here on the, that's where he is. How many years of skill acquisition must he get within a year of school in order to close that gap? Well, the answer's up there. You need to pick up two and a half years of skill for every year in school. Now, that's a heavy lift. Heavy lift. So this is sort of the, I share that with you uh, to understand just the, the, the challenge that, that um, in, and I know that for those of you who teach and those of you whose children go here, you, you're aware of that. You live it. You walk it. Okay. The good side of that story is this. When you look at the story of what is happening here in the lives of so many of the children that come here, is that you know, more than one year of gain is often taking place within a year of time within in grade. And that's what we want, is those, that gap to be closed. But the, when kids, ki not only do kids sense that they are you know, not keeping up, they start to feel what about themselves? They start to get down on themselves. They start to give up. There's, there's a host of emotional reactions to that, right? And so that's what, the, sort of the backdrop against this um, for what we're gonna, I'm going to share today. So let me just take you back to my first year of teaching school. You think Boston's cold? <laughs> You think Boston has snow? I started teaching school in Barrow, Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> it 
which is an Eskimo village. Okay? And so that's, that's uh, about noon. <laughs> There's another picture. Now, I went to uh, Alaska in not having had one course in education. They were desperate for teachers. They would take couples if one of the two was certified. My newly wed wife of now 45 years was a certified teacher, so they took me as excess baggage. They paid me $2,000 less than her. She has never let me forget it. <laughs> that she earned more than me and she got me my first job. And, um, but I'll never forget, I was, I was excited about this adventure, quote, adventure. <laughs> Why? Because I loved learning. I was turned on by books and ideas and so forth. I couldn't wait to get with these kids to light their fire. Okay? One of the most gut-wrenching experiences I have had in my life is to see what, or witness what I witnessed that year. I witnessed the lights go out in their eyes, one by one. Because I didn't know how to teach kids who struggle in learning. And nothing is worse than to, to see them closed down by way of effort, and then when you know the things that are going on inside their heart and their tummy. And so that put me on the path that I'm on, and that's why I'm here today. We're in search of answers so the lights don't go out in kids' eyes. Let me tell you about Jennifer. Jennifer was a young girl from Indiana in the mid-80s, before internet, wrote me a letter. So I don't know how she learned about what I did, but I received a letter from Jennifer. At the time, she was a ninth grade student. And I have, that began a correspondence. We corresponded for several years. And I've got a file of the, the letters that we sent back and forth. I'm going to share with you three little excerpts of letters that, were, that, we, that I received from here. Here's a ninth grade student. I have so many feelings of being different from everyone else because it is hard for me to learn. It takes a while for me to figure out what's going on around me. I get so confused with all the different things people expect me to learn and remember. I always feel stupid about not knowing more than my younger sister. Please write and tell me what I should do. Um, you, you know, you can just envision the things that are going on in her heart and, and tummy. Here's as a 10th grader. I think having a learning disability has taught me how much a person like myself need to fight what is hurting them physically and mentally. Things are just terrible in school. When my teachers treat me like I can't learn, I feel like a baby. It just, just convinces me that I really am stupid. There are times I feel so different, so left out, so lonely, and so ha sad. I have a very dead heart about life. So failure in school has an emotional dimension to it. Now, again, for those of you who are, are parents, and I know you were in classrooms today, but I'll tell you, and, and I was asked, hey, what, what's your take of what's happening? You know, the first thing in learning to make it of the foundation to good learning is to have someone who cares and is sensitive to loneliness and hurting inside and dead hearts. And that's, that's what, what exists in this place and why it's, it's such a special place. Here's... Jennifer is a young adult. Most mornings now I wake up thinking about how unsuccessful I have been and how stupid I will always be. I look at my little daughter when she is asleep and hope that she doesn't turn out like me. So, um, a little backdrop. This is Samantha Beale. Any of you know Samantha? She's written some things. I met Samantha initially when she was um, in junior high school. I was speaking at a conference in Michigan, and it was a, 
uh, several hundred people in the audience, adults just like this. And I noticed on the front row was this young girl. And I thought, now why is she here? And you know, I thought, well, maybe she's getting a student award or something like that. After my remarks, I was responding to questions and so forth, and I noticed she was standing at the side. And she was waiting there to talk to me, along with her mom, her teacher, and an artist. And she um, basically explained she had a very severe disability in math. I mean, big time severe. But she was great with poetry and writing. And she shared with me some poetry that she had written. And it was, it was absolutely beautiful. And the artist had illustrated some of her poems. And they were asking, do you know where she could get published? So I made some recommendations and she has been published and she's been on Good, uh, Good Morning America back at that time. And I want to share with you an excerpt that she wrote in this book, which is not her first, called My Thirteenth Winter. And she said this, and just to get a feel for it. I hate going to, to the store to buy music, a book, clothes, groceries. I also dislike the idea of people finding out that I didn't get things that were so simple for everyone else, like comparing prices or figuring out a 15% tip. And then she, she goes into this actual example when she's standing in line in a store to check out. Here's what she said. This is her amusing to herself. Standing in the checkout line, I saw, I, checkout line, all my movements seem exaggerated. Awkward. I feel as if I'm on stage, like I don't belong, as if everyone is staring at me, judging me. I think they all see the stain in my shirt or that my jacket doesn't match. A thousand eyes seem to scrutinize my appearance, confirming my every insecurity. My lips get dry. I don't know where to look because someone will read my glance, interpret it, judge me, know that I don't know what I'm doing. I wait for a woman ahead of me to finish writing out her check. I wait for my test. The, movement, the woman moves out of view and with stifling breath I step up to the counter and place the items down. It feels reassuring to have something to do. But then I begin to feel self-conscious that I'm taking too long at the counter. The store clerk finishes ringing up the total, looks at me, and he says, fifteen dollars, fifteen twenty-eight. Fifteen dollars and twenty-eight cents. I have a twenty. I go blank. I don't know if it's enough. To stall, I repeat back the total to make sure I have it right. The woman behind me suddenly feels like she's very close, as if she were pressing against me. I can hear and feel the impatience in her breathing, the rumpling of her shopping bags. A few seconds stretch into forever. I feel like everyone behind me is becoming impatient and hostile. Shame flushes into my cheeks. I look down, hesitate for a second, and pull out the 20. For an instant, my heart stops. All sound retreats. Everything feels as if it's moving in slow motion. As I hand the clerk the $20 bill and watch for his reaction, waiting to read the unspoken signs that I haven't given him enough. He glances at it, accepts it, and turns to the register. Instantly, the world resumes its movement in real time, and the knot in my stomach unravels. All the pushing impatience of bodies behind me fade away. They feel like ordinary people waiting their turn. I can breathe again, I smile, I say thank you, and walk out. Once again, I have just barely escaped disaster. So, learning is an emotional, visceral, affective experience. This is Dre. Dre is our grandson, one of our grandsons. Um, and he's this happy little kid. Here he's about three and a half, four years of age, just normal as can be. Then he acquired this very rare syndrome called Landau-Kleffner syndrome. 
It's a nocturnal seizure disorder. And in the course of about six months, he lost all his language. Okay. And <clears throat> in order to stop the steroids, you see him there, they had to put him on, uh, to stop the seizures, they had to put him on steroids. So you can hardly recognize the little guy. So you can imagine, you know, what his images were of himself and so on. Here he is as he got off the steroids. He loves to fly. His dad's a pilot and so forth. But, um, you know, the, I, the reason I share that with you is to let you know that we're walking it in our family. Okay. And, and both the academic and, and the, the social emotional side. So as I said, learning is generally an emotional, visceral, affective experience before it's a cognitive one. Think of yourself, the, t the butterflies you had in your tummy as you were to take a test or called upon to speak extemporaneously or something like that. We've all been there. So, how do emotions drive physiology? We've been doing some research with an organization called HeartMath. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, but they're trying to, to understand, you know, just a little footnote. Are there clocks at Carroll? <laughs> I, oh, that's the first one I've seen today. <laughs> The reason I ask, you know, and I, that's fine. You know, you, you, you want to have kids forget time. That's, that's good. I broke my watch a couple months ago, and now I got to go with this, and it's just, excuse the, the footnote. I'm sorry. But we teamed with HeartMath because they're interested in understanding this connection between emotion and learning. And what they find is that emotions are faster than thoughts. Emotions drive physiology through pa two pathways, the autonomic nervous system, the hormonal nervous system. And positive emotions lead to those things. Things that we all want for ourselves and for our kids. Now here's, you can see emotional memories, the slow track, you take it in through your eyes, you process it through your brain and, and so forth, okay? But if the situation changes, that thing gets short-circuited, okay? And the activation of a whole different system of operation w within us. So what heart math does is that we're looking at what happens with kids under emotionally stressing times. And so we'll put a little clip on their ear, on their finger or something as they're reading, as they're doing math problems and so forth. And what we're looking for is their um, heart rates, that's, you know, that's what it's called heart math, they look at, and there's this, this correlation between, and what we want is this, uh, this notion of coherence, of an, an, an even heart rate and so forth, as opposed to one that is under chaos. And you can see that here. Here's a husband <laughs> <laughs> during an argument with his wife. Now this is... <laughs> Heart rate, you know, it's about 60 beats a minute. That's normal, right? Going along, the wife says something to get under his skin. <laughs> you notice what happened there. And notice how the heart rate remains elevated after the argument ends. And this is an hour time period. OK? You can see some of you are identifying with this. <laughs> What are the, the effects of positive emotions? Just skim down that list and look at them. Because of those effects, that's why we as a research center are interested in looking at these factors and trying to better understand emotionality and learning and things that, that are associated with it. So, here's a, little, here's a little procedure that we used in one of the studies we did. It's called the coherence technique, okay? Now what it does, it's designed to help anyone who does it release stress, balance their emotions, and feel better fast. Okay? Now it sounds like I'm a commercial, you know, and you can, here's the 800 number. Uh, this is a research organization, and, but it, we, it's simple, and you'll see the next three steps 
are very simple and it has to be that way in order for this to automatically kick in. So step number one in coherence is we teach the person to focus the, the, their attention on the area in their heart, in the center of their chest. We have them in visualize that. Okay. Secondly, we have them maintain, they maintain their heart focus and while breathing, imagine that your breath is flowing in and out through the heart area. So they're concentrating on their breathing and they're concentrating on that part. You see we're, we're, we're changing the, the location of that. And then the third step is we have them envision something that's positive in their life. You know, just something that brings you back to a, a feeling of comfort, of warmth, of appreciation, and so forth. Now, we did a study in inner city Austin, Texas. Kids from some very diverse backgrounds, very challenged home situations, and so forth, and struggling academically. And we taught them this procedure. And, you know, we were looking, interestingly, I know you're using the MAP test here, we were using the MAP test there, or you're doing some trials with it. And there was significant differences to those who were taught when they encounter anxiety producing situations to use this procedure or this technique. It's simple, but it takes practice. You know, you can't, I can't just tell you this and you immediately do it. It took several weeks of practice and prompting by the teacher and conversations around it. But it was striking evidence to us that when we're wanting to improve academic performance, it's important for us to consider dimensions of the entire person, of the entire child, and not just the academic dimension. Now, interestingly, then they have with it some computer programs. So the, your purpose here is to keep the balloon afloat. And so when, when they are wired up to this, they practice their right kind of breathing and relaxing. And if, if they do it right, the balloon stays afloat. If they get up tight, the balloon sinks. And then to really, it's counterintuitive, they have a race car. And, and in order to win the race, you got to breathe slower and relax. Just think of that. The kids, the kids love it, but it, it, it changes. Okay, so there's just a little uh, d device that we use. It's called the, the M-Wave. Okay, another piece of research that we've been doing is with a Q sensor. A Q sensor is, you wear, kids wear it on their wrist. Um, and it's designed to, to show their electrodermal activity. In other words, when they get stressed, what effect does that have? And once again, we find a correlation between kids who are less anxious have higher reading scores. Okay, now we're trying to understand those linkages. I mean, there, there are correlations at this point, but it's, it's telling us what we need to, some things we ought to look at. Here's a little road map of what I'd like to now take us down for the remainder of our time. Number one, I'd like to share with you a little snapshot of some current work on improved student outcomes. I think it'll, it'll be informative to you, hopefully. Secondly, uh, I'd like, then like to now focus in on some specific social-emotional learning. Thirdly, talk a little bit about some school-wide screening and finally some sample interventions uh, of things that relate to social emotional learning and, and helping kids with not just their emotions of how they feel in an anxiety producing situation. You know, as we talked about Samantha uh, or Dre or Jennifer, all those were sort of, um, uh, you know, anxiety producing. But the other big part, that's the emotional. The other big part is the social. How do kids engage with those around them? And if we sense that we are being excluded by the group, or things are being said unkindly to us, that can be very 
you know, disheartening and, and so forth. So we need to attend to the social side. So let's look first at a snapshot of current findings. Here's some, some this is based on some work that's been done by Elaine Allensworth and her colleagues in Chicago. Here's the prevailing mindset within our country today about schooling. The logic behind curricular push to increase college readiness. Number one, we come up with a more co challenging college oriented curriculum. You've heard about the common core, common core state standards and so forth. That's the whole push in our country is up the set of expectations. That in turn will lead to increased learning and stronger skills and ultimately higher attainment, educational attainment. However, <laughs> that's a, an assumption, okay? Everyone assumes that. We don't know if that's true. So Allensworth and, and her colleagues have done some fascinating research and what they have found is this is that students' grades depend much more on their, than on their core academic knowledge and skills. In other words, how, and, and one's future, get this, depends, is more highly correlated with one's grades than with standard test scores. Do you hear that? That's important to understand for the next step I'm going to share with you here. Okay? Now you're probably freaking because say you know some of the grades that your kids have gotten and so forth. Hold on. <laughs> Elaine says they are affected by a host of non-cognitive factors, including behaviors, mindsets, perseverance, learning strategies, and social skills. Okay? Those are the things that will have a big influence on grades that children receive. So what cognitive, what factors contribute to grades? This has been sort of the prevailing assumption. You know, content knowledge and academic skills, that's what drives test scores and that's what's measured by test scores, which is true. However, those things are less measured by grades, but non-cognitive factors um, also influence grades. But you see, the non-cognitive factors, they don't influence test scores, okay? Non-cognitive factors, um, do they have an impact on a job interview? Yeah, they do. So what are non-cognitive factors? Anything not measured by cognitive tests, achievement or IQ tests. So it's those things. This stuff that isn't, the stuff that isn't content knowledge or core academic skills, but that matters for school performance. So there's a large literature on the skills, strategies, and beliefs. So just take a look at the literature that is saying if you attend to these kinds of things, it will enhance your performance in, in performance in school. So just l scan through this list of things in which there is a positive literature. Yes? No, I think one of the things in this community is we have a little bit of a different vocabulary. Okay. Um, and within cognitive research, we also have a lot of that in like working memory. Okay. And, and fluid intelligence. Okay. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that, no, no. Yeah, what I'm, okay, what I'm talking about, yeah, what I'm talking about are, are like the Iowa test of basic skills or something like, like that. <laughs> but the, the, the important, the important thing is this, is, and we don't need to get hung up on the, on the correlation aspect. I think the big message is this. There are some dimensions of learning that have to do with a child's ultimate success that have nothing to do necessarily with academic skills and the content knowledge that we pick right. up. I think, I think that, that's that's I think the that's key very message. Very yeah. Yeah. 
You, you have to just factor in I'm from Kansas, okay? <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Okay, so five categories. Elaine says non-cognitive ones. So you can see some of those things and why it's important as we're doing instruction to, to, to wrap the academic and content instruction around those things. And I saw that and hear about that happening here. And that's what is exciting. So I'm going to quickly just skim through this because I want to get at, at some other things. It, just look at this. This is her model. If we can stand back and just look at the big picture here. At the bottom where everything is, is, is aiming is to Im improve academic performance. Look at the things that, that impact that. So we're going to be taking a look at social skills and how that can play into this. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time specifically on learning strategies, but I spent a good deal of time researching that in my career. And I might just say this about learning strategies. Learning strategies, in essence, is um, are techniques or procedures that help us learn. It's teaching us how to learn rather than just the content. Okay? Give a person a fish and he can fish, eat for a day. Teach him how to fish, he can eat for a lifetime. That's our purpose behind learning strategies. Teach kids how to learn. And it's important that we do that and that we say, here's a passage to read. And there's one way that you can do it. And they usually kids who are struggling read word for word for word. There's some other ways that more fluent or accomplished readers do that. In which they may read the first sentence and read the last sentence. They may skim over some things. They may look at the graphics. A host of things that we do that tend to be strategic in nature. We do them automatically because we're good learners. Kids who struggle in learning don't do those things automatically. So what we do is we deliberately and explicitly teach them strategies. We teach them how to learn. We give them some new pathways to follow, some new tactics to learn to deal with those demands of the curriculum. We try to empower them. Now, once we teach them a strategy, it is important critically important to do this. To have kids stand back from learning this new strategy and have conversations with them. Hey, tell me, what's different about, remember how you used to do it? <coughs> Describe that one to me. Now, how are you doing it? How does it feel differently? Now, you look at your results here. You're getting good results. How come you're getting these better results? Now, it's important for kids to see that they've gone from here to here and be able to attribute that to the correct thing. Because if you'll ask many kids who have a history of failure, if you've gone from down here to up here and ask them how come, What's a likely answer they'll give to us? I was lucky, or the teacher gave me an easy task. In other words, it was luck, or the task was something out there. It was not me. So if we teach any of these things up here, we always have to go to the balcony, if you will and stand back from it and have the conversation about why this new way of doing business, this new way of learning is different and why it seems to be working or not working. And to have those, those conversations because the business of schooling is as much in figuring out how we learn as in the learning. 
and it is to look at ourselves as learners and always ask questions about how could I perhaps have done it better or differently. That's what metacognition is. It's standing back and looking at it. Oftentimes, the kids who struggle are so much down in the weeds and so much with blinders on that they don't have those conversations in their own mind. I remember when I was a freshman in college, I had done great through high school. Then I went to college and, oh my word, I didn't know what hit me when I got these D's like in dog, not B, a D. And I'd never experienced that before. And I had to stand back and have these conversations about how I was, I was learning. Well, I could do it. You know, you could do it. Well, kids who are struggling and learning, they need to be taught how to have those conversations. They can do it, but they need to be taught how to do it and the importance of doing that. Okay? Okay, let's do a little focus on social emotional learning. What is social emotional learning? <clears throat> it's the process of acquiring core competencies to recognize and, and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, appreciate the perspectives of others, establish and maintain positive relationships, make responsible decisions, handle interpersonal situations correctly. So it's a lot that goes into that pot. A lot of things that make a big difference between success and failure in life. <clears throat> the definition, it, it, it falls into these categories. We're just going to quickly look at this. The PowerPoint, see if can we get these posted on the website or something. Okay, just look at the big categories. Like, are kids self-aware? And look at what the things that, that are involved with being self-aware. Social awareness, perspective taking, empathy, appreciating diversity, respect for others, and so forth. Responsible decision making. I'll tell you, the, the, just this small little snapshot I've had of what's going on here, I saw so much of that taking place. Okay? Some very deliberately a teacher engaging a student on something in a conversation. Others, you know, it was just a part of the flow and go, but very purposeful. I was going down to the middle school, well, we're here with Liz this morning. And the way she greeted every, every student by name, and then as students would respond back, and she was just, it wasn't just a flippant thing, but it was a sincere hello, and then one of the students responded back to her and she said thank you for, how did you say it? It was just so natural. What did you say? Hi, how are you? And you said, good, how are you? And I said, I'm well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for, I mean, it was just part of it. It sounds insignificant. That was a reinforcement of a proper behavior. It was just automatic and integral to what is happening. Self-management, impulse control, and so forth and relationship management. So that, those are the things that go in, into it. But consider this, when we look at all those things, consider this. The social emotional group, and this is from a study, large meta-analysis, hundreds of thousands of kids. SEL, social emotional learning group, okay? The kids who were taught those kinds of things that we just went through. Demonstrate an 11 percentile point gain in academic achievement over the control group. Okay? So if, if, is it worth spending some time doing this? Right? And so forth. So I, I, I think those are some pretty compelling data. So the question is, what was the driving force, however, behind those gains? Not only did those authors, Durlach and, and colleagues, do the, the analysis of all these studies, but then they, when they found that, that difference, they said, how come? What characterizes that instruction that was done with kids in social-emotional learning? And they found this. Number one, there was generally some kind of school-wide screening to figure out where, what's, what's the temperature of the school? Where, where do we need to zone in? Because schools are different from place to place. Secondly, the instruction was systematic, it was direct, and it was explicit. So it wasn't just incidental, but hey, 
it is important that we teach kids how to give positive feedback. It is important that we teach kids how to enter a group conversation. It is important that we teach kids, if they're going to interrupt, how to interrupt correctly. So that's an explicit behavior that we want to, to have them acquire, and there's some explicit ways to teach it. Sec thirdly, that instruction is not only taught explicitly, but you look for opportunities to integrate it in a very natural way, like Liz did when we were going, passing the kids on the walkway. And then finally, across settings. And I went to your fabrication laboratory today, and it was such an exciting place because one of the big challenges you've got in teaching kids social skills is to have a place for them to practice them naturally. You see, if we're teaching kids reading, and we're teaching them in a, one set of materials that are sort of an easier level, they're acquiring the skills, we want them to apply it to a little more difficult materials, right? No problem. Put that book away and put another one in front of them. A no-brainer. Okay, you teach a kid a social skill of asking for help appropriately. You can teach it, you can role play it in class. How do you create situations for that to occur? You have to have the ropes course and all those things that you've got and the, the fab lab and, and so forth. So those kinds of things that you see being created here, they're purposeful and they have a, a reason behind them we can link that directly to the explicit instruction that is taking place. Okay, just briefly a, a word on, on school-wide screening. Um, and I, as a matter of fact, I'm thinking I might even skip through. Oh, I want to show you because you asked what's in it. Okay. Uh, okay, how about if I went over this with you later? Would, would that be okay? <laughs> I mean, you, you can see this is a put them to sleep slide. <laughs> But I, I do want to say this, if oh, another thing on social skills, when it says across settings, the extension is within the home. Okay? There's only so much that can happen here, but to have that correspondence and that communication back and forth, and for things that are taking place here, to be reinforced in practice at home. And through this, you can see it faculty and staff will, parents will, administrators will, and so forth. So we'll talk about that offline. Okay. Okay, some sample interventions. I want to finish this so we can answer some questions. Remember I said this before that was repeat. Okay, social skills instruction in the, in the classroom. All students should receive this instruction. All kids need it. All kids need it. If we're competent, we can become more competent and refined. Okay, we can always become better people. And that's what's at the base of, of social skills instruction. We want to set expectations for socially appropriate behavior. That's something else I saw happening here in the limited time I've been here, is this is an environment that is expectation rich. And the expectations are communicated in a host of ways to kids. Things that are on the walls, things that are said, cues that are given to students by teachers and, and others. It's important that basic skills should be taught and can provide the foundation for more complex social skills, such as looking at someone in the eye. Sort of basic, but it's foundational to so many of the more complex social skills. And that's one that has to be prompted and practiced and so forth. There's one thing to look in the eye. I mean, you can sort of look in the eye and stare through the person, or you can look into a person's soul, you know, and really try to connect with them. And you have conversations about that and talk about how it feels and so forth to be the recipient of that and so forth. So we have developed a, a host of of strategies, social skills strategies. We put them in the form of manuals because that's what facilitates the instructional process with here's what you do, here's what you say, here's some worksheets and, and so on. So I'm just going to touch upon a, a couple of these 
cooperative thinking strategies are how kids work together, how they solve problems together, how they think together. And, and we don't just throw them into groups, but we very purposely put them there and teach them and model for them how to do it. The purpose, to enable kids to learn skills for working in groups, have them learn simple structures for completing higher order thinking tasks together. Because think of the workplace. That's what is required in the market today in so many places. We need to be practicing it here. And to enable teachers and students to learn how to create a learning community within our classrooms and so forth. So there's is a host of strategies that we've developed to help kids learn together, to think together, to solve problems together. A foundational one is um, the score skills. Okay? And that's, that's this. It's sort of foundational to every, everything. And it's, if, as, as we're interacting one with another, we talk about the importance of a dynamic group as being able to share ideas. And one group I met with today, I made the point that we teach there are, is, there are no milkers. Do you know, and then no one in the group knew what I meant, so obviously. <laughs> I don't think they were slow, so it was obviously me. A milker from Kansas <laughs> or Montana, where I was born and raised, is a person who drinks the milk but doesn't do anything to produce the milk. Okay? So, have you ever been in a group where someone just sort of sits back and lets everyone else do the work? Uh uh. No, that's not the way we do it here. We all have a responsibility to share our ideas. And under each one of these, there are some specific things that how you do that. Okay? All those things need to be explicitly taught. Another thing, the C part of, of, of score is complement others. How do you give, what are the elements of a compliment? How do you do it sincerely? Okay? Not in a plastic, rote kind of way. But, and, you know, to work that through. And initially, when we're practicing it, it will be rote. It will be plastic. But, you know, we work on those things. We first get it down in an automatized, root, routinized kind of way. And then we talk about the refinements. But we work on that over time. And kids learn, and they start to feel the difference of how they're relating to them. Offer help or encouragement. If you're a member of a group and, and someone else has a task to do that's different from yours and you see that you could maybe help them, how do you offer help without having them feel incompetent? And how do you look for timing, the right timing to do it? There's a lot of things that are built in here that we can build in some valuable school skills that kids can learn. Our recommend changes nicely. <laughs> you know? You know, as my advisor in graduate school said, any fool can criticize, and most fools do. And so if you're going to, to you see something that's not happening, well, how do you make it a recommendation in a nice way? And how do you exercise self-control? Okay. So those are the score skills. A shift to another um, thing that we will teach, that we've done a lot of work on, research on, to help kids in this area of social emotional learning. And this is in the, uh, an area that we call possible selves. You familiar with possible selves? You've heard that notion? Okay, little brief lesson on, on this. Possible selves are ideas about one might about what one might become in the future. Okay? So we're looking to the future. Now, one's vision, generally speaking, of the future can be motivating. Dream. What do you want to become? Not what is happening now. What would you like to become and do? Now, our future vision, however, includes three dimensions of self. Okay? There's a hope for self the thing that we hope will happen. There's an expected self. Well, in all likelihood, this is what will happen. And then there's a feared self. OK? 
okay, if these things go wrong, here's what's going to happen. And you can imagine kids who have a history of failure, you know, a lot of these feared things are going to surface. This is the opportunity to deal with that and to have constructive conversations around it so we can change their internal dialogue. So there's a host of things. This is a whole instructional program. There's a manual that goes with it. But we start out by talking about the kids' interests to the future. Who am I? What am I like? What can I be? How can I get there? And then working on how am I doing? So it's a whole cycle that we go through. Um, and we have some interviews. We see we conduct an interview around things that best describe the student. Now, we started this research at the University of Kansas. We, our center got the assignment to work with all the at-risk student athletes. Okay? And we found that they were unmotivated. There was just a lot of, of those SEL behaviors that weren't there. So this is where we went. And we asked them questions about themselves as an athlete, themselves as a learner, and themselves as a person. Okay? And so we'd ask, what statements or words best describe you as an athlete? What statements or words best describe you as a learner? What does best describes you as a person? And then, what do you hope to achieve as an athlete? What do you hope to achieve as a learner and so forth? What do you expect to achieve? And what do you fear as an athlete? Now you can imagine for an athlete, I'm going to blow out my knee. Their hope is they're going to play in the NFL. Their expectation, they'll probably play in the minor leagues. Yeah. So it, it's, it's around those things. And then what we do is we have the kids sketch out a possible selves tree. Okay? And this is one of the kids. And each of the, the limbs is something. Like in this case, one of the limbs is as a, the kid as a learner, one as a person, and the other as a worker. Okay? And as a, through this process, we identify things that can help them or things that are sort of working against them, like have gotten noisy roommates or whatever it is. And you put negative things down here in the soil. And so kids can really use their creative powers to, to this one was a little plain in terms of creativity. Um, but you can see how much they, like this see his athlete tree or limb, as well as learner limb, and so forth, and to see how these change over time. A part of this is the kids making an individual, personal mission statement. Mission statement. And we have done research studies looking at the mission statements over time. They change dramatically when we work explicitly with kids around these kinds of things. Okay, and so that, that's, this is a basically a process, possible selves, is a process of starting with one's dreams, learning things about oneself, and then backing that into specific goals and tasks to get you there. So it's a goal setting strategy. But it's done in a different perspective. And I'm going to conclude with this one, then questions. And this is a self advocacy strategy. This is something that is so important on a lot of dimensions. It's important within a school. If you want to advocate for yourself as a learner, here's how I learn, here are the kind of conditions I need to help me learn. And you're going to need those skills when you go on to post-secondary education. You get into a, uh, there's just a lot of places we can use advocacy. So, let's explicitly teach it. Now, the place that we started to do this work was when we were helping kids prepare to go into an IEP meeting. Okay? Because by law, kids can be there, right? But also, the reality tells us they are there and they sit there like bumps on a log. Okay? We want to change that dynamic. And here's what happened in the research study we did. We looked at the goals that ended up on a kid's IEP if they basically said nothing. 
okay, kids, goals that they valued on their IEPs. They are about 10 percent. If they are actively involved, about 85 percent of the things that they are of interest on in one way or another end up on the IEP. So now you have, a, it's a different dynamic. So here's what's involved. First of all, we teach kids, if you're going to advocate for yourself or engage with someone else, you need to present yourself appropriately. You want to present information, so you need to learn the share steps. S is sit up straight. H, have a pleasant voice tone. Now, you can envision, we practice all these things, examples, non-examples, and so forth. A, activate your thinking. Anytime you're engaged in a conversation, you need to be really focused in on what others are saying. Tell yourself, prompt yourself to pay attention, to stay on the task at hand. Tell yourself to participate. Tell yourself to be comparing ideas as, as they surface. Okay? R is relax. You know, whenever we're in a group setting, we can get up tight. And so we need to prompt ourselves to do that. With the heart math thing, if they've learned that, we would teach them to focus on breathing in those three steps of the heart math thing. Okay? And then engage in eye communication. We use that term as opposed to eye contact. Eye communication is where you can see it, look into someone's soul. Eye contact is when you see the hair on the back of their skull. <laughs> okay. Then the, cell, the steps of the self-planning uh, strategy are called I plan. Now what we do, and I'll just go through these, I plan is, so I, you know, I'm, I'm planning before I go advocate for myself. So think of this in terms of an IEP, then you modify it for other things. But before kids go into an IEP, we have them inventory their strengths their areas to improve, their goals, their choices for learning or accommodations. For them to become aware of themselves as learners. And we have inventory sheets that they fill out. Then they do that before the conference, how they think about it, they complete the worksheet and so forth. Then the P part is when you're in the IEP or in the meeting. They provide their inventoried information so they have that with them as a prompt. Those are the things that they want to try to get out there. Those are the areas they talk about. L is listen and respond. And this is when they listen, this is when they respond, and so forth. We go through all that. A is ask questions, and we go through a whole instructional routine. How do you ask questions? When do you ask questions? When do you interrupt? When don't you interrupt? And N, name your goals. The last one who speaks generally wins. OK, so to, to summarize and to say what your goals are. Now, as a public school I work with in Ken or a private school I work with in Kansas City, the Horizon Academy, every one of their kids sits in on their IEP with, with this. This is just a part of how they do the business there. Okay. I'm going to conclude with this. Everyone has, we all have belief windows. You know what a belief window is? It's this invisible window in front of our eyes that's attached to our head. And it's through that window that we see the world. Let's say if you see this little kitty cat, and your little, a little child sees a kitty cat like that, it snuggles up, and it's nice and purry and for, warm and fuzzy. He writes something on his belief window about little kitty cats, right? So then the next day he comes over, and the kitty cat's having a bad hair day, and he bites and scratches him. Oops, something else gets written on the belief window about kitty cats, right? What we experience influences how we see the world. For example, Mother Teresa, how did she see the world? What was on her belief window about other people? What would be on the belief window of someone like this about certain people? Do our beliefs drive who we are? They do. And so dealing with these kinds of dimensions coupled with solid academic instruction is what goes into making someone successful who can be happy and compete in the world ahead. So with that as a little backdrop, I'm willing to try to respond to any questions that you might have or comments. Uh, yeah, but I don't agree with that. Uh, yes. Yes.
other questions? Yeah, Ruth? So how do you think this, the way you think about this is either more or less challenging for kids with learning differences? OK, the question is, how does, is this more or less challenging for kids with learning differences? All the research that we've done, like on the score skills, I self-advocacy and possible selves and so forth, we've done it with kids with learning differences. So what the, um, what we need to make certain we do is to match the type of instruction by way of explicit modeling, scaffolded learning opportunities for them to practice it, and then explicitly build in opportunities for them to generalize, transfer, and to utilize it in other settings. For kids who have learning challenges, we just need to be more deliberate on those things. And so that's the key thing. One of the beautiful things of what's happening at Carroll School um, is the awareness that the staff has. Everyone knows everyone of the kids. And they have meaningful, deep conversations about each of the children. That is so significant. And it's the foundation upon which these kinds of things can, can be planned. Other questions? Yes. How do you shift the focus of thinking of, you know, a lot of kids that have had learning difficulties and difficulties in schools, thinking about the possible self thing? Like shift the focus for personal experience, but where where they view like a fear self that comes they start thinking of that as the expected self, they kinda of shift the focus to you know, focusing so, on the hope for So so they lower their expectations, is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, Right, right, right. Yeah, great, great question. Yeah, no, 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 great, yeah, great question. We want to get those things out and to make it, you know, so they can talk about it, they draw it, and then we stand back from it, but they can look at those things that are feared things or negative forces in their life that they're feeling, you know, sort of bring them down. And we can look at it in the, the big scheme of things and point out their strengths and so forth. And if they're looking at that fear and say, okay, let's address it. What, what can we do to take that on? And it, 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 it surfaces, it makes it something that we can deal with. That's, that's what we've tried to do here. And it, understand, when we're talking about these kinds of things, we're getting some pretty emotional things. And it's not a, a straight line between point A and point B. Um, but we've, um, uh, and it certainly doesn't work for all children. But, but what we've seen, the, the shifts, is, is pretty dramatic in how students start to think differently about themselves. Yes, here and then there. Um, is it common for kids, especially with the, it seems like there's, um, they either think they're going to fail or they're going to be superstars, but that middle ground seems to be immediate. Non-existent. <laughs> is that a common thing? <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think that's uh, not terribly uncommon. You know, we, uh, with, with children, I think even for ourselves, you know, we, we sometimes think, oh yeah, I can get the house cleaned in 30 minutes or something. <laughs> you know, man might think that when it's really an eight hour job. <laughs> You know, so it's just a craziness kind of thinking like that. Or when you fail so long, your mind automatically goes down here. So I don't think having, experiencing those extremes is all that unusual. No. Uh, um, yeah. So I really enjoyed your talk. I'm Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and I, 
I found your talk extremely difficult to understand you know, on one level, on a disciplinary okay. level. Okay. Because, uh, but I also really understand exactly what you're talking about, it, about a sort of a person who's in school and works with kids level. Okay. And um, I guess what I want to talk about a little bit is the way we can relate um, the understanding that learning differences emerge from a, a brain basis, a biological basis, mm -hmm. and and why children who have trouble learning to read in typical environments might have trouble with um, some of the kinds of social learning um, that are so important. Um, you know, I, we, we talk a lot about um, common features of, of children with dyslexia. So a lot of our kids struggle, struggle with reading. They also struggle with math. They struggle with handwriting. They struggle with executive function problems. And I just, I just know intuitively that some of them, I actually know this from working with them, that many of them struggle with certain components of social emotional life. And I don't think the, the causal area is all going from school struggle. I think um, we know yeah. that executive, children with executive function problems have trouble with emotional regulation sure. in itself. So <coughs> I think the reason it was so hard for me to understand what you were saying is there's virtually, a bridge has virtually not been built between a brain-based cognitive neuroscience and social psychology. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, could we build that bridge a little bit? Just in a minute or two here. So <laughs> when, you think, when you think something, I mean, how that you wrote the theory of working memory, yeah. wrote an editorial in the APA yeah. you know, saying we need to do this. And I think we need to do it yeah. because kids have a of these kinds of problems and it's not yeah. So yeah. No, I just well. Listen, and you're going to meet with a cogn cognitive neurologist right after this meeting, and you. <laughs> no, I, I won't even take that one on. I, I, I certainly didn't didn't mean to imply that there's the only cause of social or emotional problems is difficulties in school. I mean, these it can exist independent of that kind of environment. And um, the, the tack that we have taken, we are in our center, we are not, um, we, we don't have brain researchers nor neurologists. We acknowledge the importance of that great work that is being done. And we're eager for those folks to inform what we're doing. Yeah, where, where we, yeah. And we shouldn't assume that we, I think we don't know it. Who's we? The, the, the universe of people, people who study these things. Well, no. We I hope I haven't tried to convey to you that I, have, uh, that I know everything. I, <laughs> I don't. What I'm trying to say is the way that we have done our work over the last 35 years is we've looked at the demands of the SETI, okay? That's why that yellow line is up there. We don't just look at the problems the kids have. We look at the demands of the settings of where they need to go. And then we say, OK, let's backward design from that and come up with some skills or strategies that will make two kinds of difference in their lives. One, a statistical significant difference. And we as researchers need to figure that one out to ensure that we're saying to teachers, if you do this with fidelity, you'll have, and you get differences, they're not by chance. Okay? But, we have to figure that we have to get an instructional procedure that makes social significant <coughs> difference. That is, that the differences that a child experiences make a practical difference in his or her life. Okay? And those are the two, well, then the third one we've held ourselves up to is a, one of feasibility, practicality. So there's, those are the three standards that we've held our interventions up to as we design them. And to say, do we get a difference with the performances of kids in school? Now, the things that we may be doing may indeed run at variance with what is being learned in brain and neuroscience and so forth. We stand prepared to modify our things as, as that information comes forward. And, and, and yeah. Just to be very clear, I, yeah. I think that there is no variance because there's almost no discussion. And I think it's really important to have the discussion. But I mm -hmm. think the important implication is what works for one kid and in one population may not work oh. without a deeper understanding of each child's particular needs. And I think that, that I, will be important. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yes, here and then there.
Oh, sorry. You're next. So I'm a mom of a first grader and uh -huh. I have a background in psychology and uh -huh. I did understand your talk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you ask a very, did you hear the question uh, referencing a, something that I wrote and I used the term disability in the title. Why did I use the term disability? Learning. Learning. Uh, it wasn't learning disability, it was just disability? Right. And maybe it's just before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I don't have a good explanation for that. I, I'm, I'm sorry, that's bad memory, but I'll just say this about the use. We struggle, if you will, in, this, in our field in terms of terminology and language. We do. Um, you know, and we're, we're trying to come up with a, a, a way to talk about these students. Matter of fact, Steve and I are involved in an effort around this in which we're playing with the term complex learners. Okay? Is that a better way to, to talk about these children? And, you know, it may indeed be. Uh, trying to get funding. Yeah, and, you know, there's some, <laughs> there's some practical things around funding and so forth, yeah. Here and then there, okay? Yeah. And where do you fit this stuff and, in? Well, and, where, and they're not, I'm not hearing them talk about it that much. Right. And if you yeah. Say, where is it? Is it? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, the question, given the Common Core State Standards, you know, which is an effort to uh, get some <laughs> common standards across all the states, and then trailing behind that are some tests, Smarter Balance and Park, that is going to up the ante and the expectations for all kids. So it's a, it's, a tough, um, it's a tough environment and a tough time in which we're living. And I think the question was, those higher standards are requiring teachers to spend even more time on the academics and the cognitive related things. Where do they find time for these non-cognitive things? Where is this research in that? Like, the 11% achievement yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Well, the question is, where is this in there? Uh, let me tell you, there's some things that made it to the table and some things didn't. And this didn't. And it started when the, when the direction and the contract was left from Washington. It didn't have basically this, these points of emphasis in it. If you want to, to sort of <laughs> read, if you're not familiar with the work of Young Zhao, the last the spelling of the last name is Z H A O, Z H A O. He's a distinguished professor now. He's at I think the University of Oregon. He used to be at Michigan State. Born and raised in China, and he's looking at the, some of these big issues. And he says he's arguing that we have it wrong in the country. We're trying to become more like some of the Far Eastern countries, Japan and Korea, and so forth. 
and we're, we're stifling some of the things that have contributed to some of the economic engine and so forth we've had. He's got a great blog and so forth. It, it, I think it just sort of builds on some of the points you're making. Yeah, there. yeah. So if we could start at the schools where the teachers are, where, they, yeah. where they're fresh and they're learning and they're ready to learn about the brain no, and how kids learn. Right. You're, you no, you are. It's a very good point I'm about scared, so future teachers. <laughs> no, future teachers. I think you're talking about future teachers and what, how might we better prepare and equip them to be emissaries as they go into schools. Um, I think that A, it is happening in some places. B, uh, I'll tell you this, this notion of the common core, it has a huge ripple effect. And it is rippling down and it, it drives what's happening for certification standards at a state. What happens in certification standards at a state drives what is taught in a pre-service education program in a university. And so, you know, it's, it's this, dynamic that, that is a, a tough one for us to, um, to go counter to. I think we need to be asking the kinds of questions you are. Have any of you read the book, The Giant Hairball? Orbiting the Giant Hairball? <laughs> okay, I think it's a great book. It's written by an, art, an artist from Hallmark Cards, which is based in Kansas City. Uh, <laughs> see, another reason to come visit. Uh, <laughs> At any rate, the artist there talks about this corporate um, culture and one memo after the other. And the more memos, the more dense it comes and the more the gravitational pull that pulls you into this big force of the hairball. And it says, we need to be loyal to the organization's mission. Okay, the mission of Common Core is good. But we need to not forsake our willingness to or our desire to look at things critically and to be creative. So we need to do everything we can to escape the gravitational pull of the giant hairball so that we can orbit around it <laughs> and be aware of what's going on and, and still ask some tough questions. I know that's a terrible answer to your question. I just don't have a good one. But it's a good book to read if you want something for Cape Cod. Yeah. Wow. That's great. That's marvelous. Thank you. One more. One more question. Um, being someone who's in higher education, where is there a place for these complex learners in college? Uh, are, are the higher education institutions receptive to kids with dyslexia? I mean, I know there are a programs around the country that yeah. 
Okay, the question was, how, how receptive are institutions of higher education to complex learners? Some are very receptive, some really pride themselves in trying to meet the needs of students. Others, uh, not so at all. Not so at all. This is why a skill like self-advocacy is an important one and possible selves. You know, so the one can keep oneself grounded. The other is to, um, there are a, a, a broad array of supports that can be found and recruited to, to put around a student to help them navigate their way through higher education. There are things increasingly that are available online by way of supports for students, um, as well as to, to get some mentors or tutors. Students that are available within a university setting who are in education and so forth. So there are, are ways that that system can and is being navigated. Do not give up hope on that at all. Do not give up hope. But there, there are some, and there are some good books uh, that are available for parents and students to, of questions to ask and things to look for as you look at higher education. And I can't think of it now, but if you'll give me your name, I'll get some of those and send those to you. Okay? So Steve, I, thank I, you I very much. I did a foolish thing. I promised Donnie he'd get to the airport on time on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you very much for it. <laughs>